Jesus wants to have a relationship with you, ma'am. Not because of what you can get out of him, but because of who he is. And who is he? He's the bread of life. I'm going to understand a little bit about that today. It's a beautiful story. Jesus is saying, I'm here to feed your soul, man. I'm here to give you what will lead you into eternal life. That's why I'm here. So let's read together. We're going to read the whole text first. Some of you like reading the whole text first. Like that man, Rod, wherever he is. Radical Rod, he likes it. He says, there, yeah, he's sitting at the back with his wife. He says, I like reading the whole text first. And then we unpack it. I don't. <laughs> because I, I get lost through it. And so I like reading one or two verses and then talking. And Friends, it's actually not what I like. It's got nothing to do with that. Church shouldn't be with what I like. And oh, the worship's great. And, 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 the, and the message... It's not about that. It's what we like. Church is halfway time, having an orange, taking an energate, and going out tomorrow, making a difference, showing people love and life. Amen? It's not about what we like and what we don't like. So I don't like really the way we're going to preach today, but anyway, it's not about me. It's about Jesus. And where is that microphone? Because church is about someone bringing a word, like Haley did this morning. Church is about someone going out their comfort zone and praying that the gospel will change people's hearts today. I, I met your husband, and we became mates, and, and you've been coming to church, Natasha, daughter of God. Will you pray today that God would touch people's hearts, not through me. I'm just a standard great oak who loves the Bible, but that the Bible would change hearts. Amen? Let's close our eyes. Dear Lord God, I pray to you in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you for bringing us all together in this school hall. Lord, I know you're building families here. Lord, I know you're building relationships. And that is the most important thing. Lord, I pray, as Daryl speaks today, that the Holy Spirit speaks to us and works in our lives, that we may become that family and that we become that person that other people can rely on and come to for help. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Beautiful. And so you shook your head. No, I can't pray. That was a beautiful prayer. Thank you. Verse 25 of chapter 6. I'm reading from the NRV. When they found him, who's they? They, the crowd whose tummies were full. they parking off on the green grass. They've had free food. These are the oaks. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the sign I performed, but because you ate the loaves and your tummies are now full. That's why you're looking for me. He goes on to say, he says, do not work for the food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Jesus is saying, God has put his approval upon me. Jesus is saying, he's given me that approval. Verse 28, then they tune him. What must we do to do the works God requires? What must we do again? It's about works, eh? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. I've been reading this one-liner because you, sir, when your mom was lying on her deathbed, it was a Friday afternoon, I was rushing back from a wedding in Milders Drift, and you said, please come to the hospital, the Lynn Med, my mom's on her deathbed, and we were on the phone, I was passing the Meadowdale off-ramp, you said, I believe. You said that. The work of God is to do this, to believe what? Our God is in heaven, he's the man upstairs. No, to believe in Jesus. Who God sent. That's the thing. We, that's the clue here. The work of God is this, to believe in the one that he has sent. So they asked him again, what sign then will you give us that we may see it and believe you? What are you going to do, Jesus? They're putting the emphasis again here on what signs Jesus is going to give them. Because now they're bringing up signs that God did for the Israelites in the wilderness couple years back, remember that. They say, yeah, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it's written. He gave them bread. Remember that in the wilderness they're hungry. So God sends down manna from heaven to eat. So they're tuning Jesus. Is he going to feed them in the same way? 
Jesus, you're going to feed us in the same way because then we don't have to worry and stress about chow for next morning and food for our families. You're going to do that the same way, giving us free food. Jesus says very truly, I say to you, it's not Moses who gave the Israelites the bread. It wasn't Moses. God used Moses. It was God, man. He sent the manna down from heaven. It's my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. My Father gives you something way better than the manna that fell down from heaven. Jesus says, my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the whole world. My Bible says whole world. So God gave manna to one nation. The Israelites in the wilderness got manna, one nation. Now God gives the true bread of heaven to the whole world. It's an amazing picture, huh? So they said, always give us this bread. In other words, give us this bread today, tomorrow, the next day, because then we'll be fine. We don't have to stress about physical food. They're not quite getting what Jesus is on about here. Verse 35, Jesus declared, it's me, guys. It is me. I am the bread of life, Jesus says. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. You just still don't understand this whole thing about who I am. All those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. What a beautiful picture of security, Auntie Cheryl. All those the Father gives and draws to him, he gives me. I will never drive them away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, Jesus says, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me. Stay with me, guys, because by now I would be lights out here. I would be battling. This is his will, that I shall lose none of all of those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son, Jesus, and believes, like you said, I believe, you've got to believe in who? God, no, in believe in Jesus. That person shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. This is a very clear verse about what it means to have eternal life. When you take your last breath, he will raise you up on your last day. Verse 41, at this the Jews now, they are rumbling and they are grumbling about him because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They constantly challenge Jesus. They're challenging him. How can you say that? How can you say that you are the bread from heaven? How can you say that you are the son of God? Who gives you the right to say that? They're rumbling, they're grumbling, they are complaining about him making these statements. They're doing this again now. They're saying, this Jesus this oak that is claiming to be sent from God. We know this oak, man. He's the son of Joseph. He is the, son, the mother of Mary. We know this oak. He was born in Bethlehem. He's grown up in Nazareth. It was a one-horse town. The horses died. There's only donkeys there now. We know this oak, man. There's nothing special about this oak. How can he claim it? How can he say that I'm the son of God? Jesus answers them. Stop grumbling. I wonder what tone, eh? Maybe wrong tone there. Maybe it's a loving tone. Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one has come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. So what Jesus is saying is those who come to me are coming to me because God is nudging them to come to me. God is drawing them to come to him. I want to cry out to Benoni and say, stop allowing, stop not allowing God to draw you. I want to cry out to Benoni. I want to say to Benoni, are you responding to God drawing you? Because God nudges, God touches people's hearts. I want to say to Benoni, are you allowing him to draw, to you, draw him towards yourself? Are you responding to that? Stop resisting God, basically. I want to say that to Benoni. Allow him to work behind the scenes in your life. There's a man who whistled here today, and he's been through a horrific week of job and stuff 
but he's able to come here and to say, God, you are drawing me to you. You are working behind the scenes. May people be more like that man. Stop resisting God. Stop hardening your heart. Allow the Father in heaven who sent Jesus to draw you. Allow him. And I will raise them up on the last day, Jesus says. It is written in the prophets. They will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. In other words, hey, you dumbos. No one has seen God except me. Because I was actually, Jesus says, I was with him in the beginning. And he sent me. I have been with him. Only I have sent him. Very truly I say to you, whoever believes, again, whoever believes, who? In Jesus has eternal life. It's not exclusive. It's for everybody, anybody who believes. But more reading to get through here. Nudge the person next to you. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the bread in the wilderness, yet they died. But he has the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. He's talking about life after death here. He says, I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Talking about his crucifixion when he's going to die on the cross. Then the Jews began to argue again sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They're trying to kind of understand it, but they're just not getting it. I love the way Jesus replies in a very higher grade statement way, but it's actually standard grade. He's sort of playing with their mind. I don't know, he's like giving them the this, this statement, but they just don't understand it. He says, yeah, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. So he's just giving this again in this very symbolic, metaphorical way. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day, for my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. These statements, friends, symbolic, metaphorical. You, you guys on your bicycles, you talk in a funny jargon uh, way, symbolic, metaphorical. This is what Jesus is doing the same. He's giving them some metaphorical, symbolic statements here. Okay? You've got to catch that. You've got to understand it here. Verse 57. You're almost done. Just as the living Father sent me, sort of repeating himself, I will live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna, they died. But whoever feeds on this bread, my bread, my body, is going to live for ever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Finished reading. You can wake up now. This is what Jesus is saying. He says, guys, I've got something for you to eat. I've got something for your soul. I want you to feed your soul with this food. And if you do, it's going to nourish you. It's going to give you life eternally that that bread cannot give. And he says, this source of food will change your life forever. And it's actually a food source that we need. Nice to see you, Auntie Dot. This is a food source we're talking about today that you really need. That bread, ah, this food source, Jesus says, you need. And the picture of Jesus giving a Christian life is of someone who eats bread. Now, for those of those die-hard, Tim Noakes, no-carb diet, <laughs> just relax a second, okay? Don't have to worry. My wife's still one of those somewhat banters. Just relax, babes. We're still going to have bread, okay? Jesus is using it as a metaphor. It's, it, it's symbolic. He's using bread to talk about his life, talk about his ministry, why he's here on earth. And Jesus was the master teacher. How many stories does he share? He's the master teacher. He's got people taking in every word that he's saying, trying to understand, not quite getting it. He's the master teacher. The symbolism of bread is proper. I'm not on Facebook, I'm on Twitter. And I saw this on Twitter. It's captured the world. 
some photographer has taken this picture. Look at that smile. How many times this week have I looked at it? It's amazing, eh? It's a, I mean, yeah, that one's a bit better there, but if you turn your head to the back, that's a proper, the, the color there is beaut. This little girl, yeah, that's nicer, eh? And that smile. Yes, I wish all, but I hope they paid that photographer a bit of cash. I mean, that's a bit of marketing on its own. But Jesus is so clever. He takes this picture of bread because every man, every woman, and every child can identify with bread. Everybody can. It's not exclusive. Simplest form of nourishment for physical energy. Everybody can identify and relate to bread. Now for me, my goodness, in my household, I wake up, oh, I go to bed at 9 o'clock at night, and, and, and there's a full loaf of bread in the house, and then I wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, and there's a half a loaf of bread. And I'm like, geez, the rats, what's going on in my house? No, my boy, 9 o'clock at night, he's awake, he smashes half a loaf with Nutella. So, that, so that's my way of, of, of relating to bread for, for us as a family, just before load shedding, M- Michelle will say, guys, we've got 15 minutes to get something ready for food. We'll have omelets on toast. Th- that's how I relate to bread in my household. Jesus is saying, I'm the true bread that comes down from heaven. So now Jesus gets us thinking about bread in a completely different way. We've got to catch it this morning. True bread, he says, that comes down from heaven. And this bread gives life. What does Jesus mean by that? What does he mean when he says it gives life? It's important for us to understand that for us as English-speaking people, we've only got really one word for life. It's life. But the Greeks had two different words for life. They had this word bio for life, which we get the word biology from, the physical life. For my Greek friends sitting there, class of 93, Benoni High, you smashed biology with an A+. I scraped through with a what, what? (laughs) But you Greeks understand there's two words when it comes to life. There's this word bio, the physical side of life. And then there's another word that you Greeks use to describe life, Vanjie. It's this word zoe. I think I've pronounced it correctly. And this word zoe doesn't refer to the physical life, the biology, and the, that it doesn't. This word zoe refers to the quality of life. You understand that? The quality of life. So I want to tell you a story to try and explain this word zoe, this quality of life. Quick one. My brother gave us timeshare. The four of us went to Cape Town. It was magnificent. Those oaks that tune the Cape Town weather's cold, got no idea but about the heart and Benoni weather. And, and so we had magnificent weather, clear skies, not a breath of wind for most of the time. And on a weekday, I think it was a Wednesday, we're sitting in Sea Point doing two things that we as a family enjoy the most. We enjoy eating together as a family, and we enjoy sitting at the sea just watching people and just taking in things around us. And so we'd ordered burgers from a burger place up the road in Sea Point, and we're sitting there chowing these burgers. But the roll, I mean, it's one thing to have a good patty. I get it. But you need a roll to have that patty. It must be a big, fresh roll. And when you bite into that roll, it must be fresh. And I'll never forget sitting there eating that roll with the patty, because it's a burger, and watching people, watching the sunset over the sea with the ships, people running, walking their dogs around. And we looked at each other sitting on that bench, the four of us, and we said, wow, this is the life. This is the life, weekday, eating burgers. This is a quality of life. Quality of life. I mean, this is, this is life. Now, for some of you, you'll go to the Kruger, and you'll expect to expect the unexpected for seven, eight hours driving in the car, and that's the life, eh, but <laughs> For that man, he, he'll take his wife 
to the middle of the free state when it's snowing in minus 30 and they'll sit up late at night because they are stargazers and they'll sit with their what's that thing called microscope what's it telescope no it's not a mic the circumference of this thing but like a proper microscope they need a bus telescope they need a bus to go on holidays just the two of them but this thing is but it's proper and they sitting outside until two three in the morning in freezing cold minus 10 looking at each other gazing into the stars saying this is the life I get it. Because for them, that's a quality of life. What, what is my family saying in Cape Town at Sea Point? What is that man saying in the middle of the free state? We are, we are saying, this is not bios. This is not just living. This is a quality. Zoe. Quality of life. When Jesus comes, he says, this is the life. That is the life that I am talking about. I'm talking about giving you a life of Zoe goes way deeper, way longer than the physical, biological side of life. This is a Zoe quality of life. And I'm wanting to give this to you in a way that you could never experience in and of yourself. I'll retire and I'll build a house at Nasdaq and collect seashells. No, no, no. And I'll go to the free states and watch stars. No, no, no. And I'll sit at the beach and have burgers and say that. No, no, no. This quality of life, Jesus is saying, goes way, way more than just the quality in life that we think. It's a quality of life that you can never experience on your own. And when Jesus says, take this bread, this symbolism, take this, he's talking about taking himself into your own life, taking him into your life. What does that result in? Not a higher grade question, it results in eternal life. But catch this, eternal life is way different to eternal existence. Say that again. Eternal life is way different to eternal existence. Because according to the Bible, everybody has an eternal existence. Every single person on this earth has an eternal existence. According to the Bible, the Bible says that your soul and my soul will never die. And the Bible's clear telling us that your soul and my soul spends eternity in one of two places. You will exist eternally in one of two places. Either you will exist with God in heaven, or you're going to exist away from God in hell. Everyone spends eternity in one of those two places, and the choice is yours. I ask you today, what is the delivery address of your soul? the delivery address of your soul where will your soul spend eternity so when Jesus comes he says I don't come to give you an eternal existence because you've already got that we all have an eternal existence he says I come to give you zoe I come to give you quality eternal life an eternal quality of life zoe he's talking about a quality of life Not only here on earth, but for eternity, forever and ever and ever. And a quality of life here on earth goes way beyond what I have and my experiences and my retirement and my possessions. It goes way beyond that. It's life that God gives a man who's resigned from his work situation and thinking, God, you are my dad. You do have a plan. I am trust. That's the life that he's talking about here that's available for you and I on earth, despite your circumstances. And so this distinction between the type of life that we live, bio, biological life, and zoe, makes all the difference in the world because it causes us to ask the question, what is it that we're trying to focus on living this quality of life? What is it that we're trying to focus on living this Zoe? Wow, this is the life experience. What is it that keeps you living and trying to live a quality of life? So let me be honest, as your friend up here, it's, oh well, Daryl, let's book another holiday in Cape Town where we can sit at Sea Point, clear skies, 
sunsets, watching people eating that incredible bread roll with that patty that's pretty average. Because I'm not the super spiritual life. Guys, I'm just like you. And, and for you, sir, it's saying, well, now I'm going to take my wife on a stargazing trip to Sutherland in the Cape somewhere because Sutherland has a 10 out of 10 experience for stargazing. It's that next experience. What is it that we're searching for for that quality of life? Let's talk about it, friends. Where do you find your Zoe? Your quality of life. What makes you wake up in the morning and think, this is my reason for living? What is it? This is my reason. This is my purpose. What is it for you? Because Jesus says you can actually pursue a certain Zoe. You can try and pursue a a certain quality of life looking in the wrong places, looking at the wrong things. He says this in verse 27. He says, don't labor for food that spoils. So we spend our whole lives pursuing something that we think is going to give us Zoe. We think and we hope it's going to give us a quality of life, but in the end, it's actually feasting on spoiled bread. It's a false Zoe. It's a false quality of life because that holiday experience in Cape Town with my best friend sitting next to me with the kids, the smooth roads, no rubbish. Some of you want to go to Cape Town. It comes to an end. It comes to an end. Those, those experiences come, come to an end. And, and that bread roll, as fresh as it was, it's going to get stale. It's going to become hard. And the, there's some examples in the Bible of false qualities of life. Let's share one or two together. Ephesians 5.18 says, do not get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Here's a question. Does the Bible condemn drinking? No. The Bible doesn't condemn drinking. Does the Bible condemn getting drunk? Why? Because that becomes a false Zoe. That becomes a false quality of life. There are people who are trying to use alcohol to numb their pain. To, to, to try and take the edge off, to try and avoid their pain. They're trying to escape reality. And people are turning to try and find some sort of hope in alcohol, something that only Jesus can give. But they're trying to search for it through alcohol. Here's another false Zoe, another false quality of life. Philippians 3.19 says, their end, in other words, those who are living a very ungodly life, their end is their destruction. How's this? Their God is their belly. Their God is their shame. Their God's their belly. Isn't that interesting? Some people on this planet who actually worship food. Yeah? And, and, and it carries on. It says, and they glory, they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. So some people turn to food. Food is the thing that gives them zoe. Food is the experience, how they eat, where they eat, that gives them this certain zoe quality of life. By the way, it cuts both ways. Great food. Some of you eat chicken and rice five days a week, don't you? Because you want to have this body. They, after all, say 75% of the way you look is what you eat. And so some of you will eat chicken and rice for a week so that people get to say to you, wow, you look great, eh? Yeah, you ripped. I'm not one of those. I'm not ripped. But let me again be honest with you. Yo, Daryl, you lean, eh? You lean, bud. See, I preached to myself today. If God is their belly. What they eat, false quality of love. After all, this body gets frail and old and weak. (laughs) Quick story. Sat with a lady at the Wimpy the other day. I don't know. I can't remember if it was a lady or a... I don't know. But that's not the point. (laughs) It was. It was my daughter. And there was, okay, I promise you that's the truth. 
Daryl, do you counsel women alone? Yes, I do, but not behind closed doors. And I'm sitting with my daughter, and she's studying. I'm working on a message at, at the Wimpy together, and, and uh, we, we're sitting, there's ladies behind us. Remember the conversation, Cass? See, and, and they're talking about <laughs> makeovers, and they're talking about, um, yeah, and I'm like, yes, these ladies, they're searching quality of life, how they look, what they do, and I'm like, yes, we're all going to get weak and die, and we're all going to go gray, and we're all going to get frail, Put so much attention on how we look at it. What we eat, God's their belly. That was by the way. Jesus is saying, be careful, guys. Daryl, he's saying, Daryl, be careful, birds. Because what you are actually pursuing is a spoiled form of bread. Okay, Daryl, let yourself go eat anything. Carry on. No, 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 no. There's balance. There's balance. Be careful that that does not become your God. Another false quality of life. Money. Money is perhaps the most spoiled bread that we can stuff into our faces. It is. A friend of mine has been saving for a long time now to take his family on a holiday to spoil them. And he sends me a WhatsApp a while ago of where they are. Check that. I mean, that is proper. Eh? That's like a picture calendar. It's even better if you turn around again. <laughs> I mean, look at that. That is magnificent. And his, his words on the photo, not there, on, my, on his WhatsApp, he says to me, living the life, bud. And so I reply, we mates, I tune, but I want to just say bless you, man. But I want to bless him with a brick, eh? I, I mean, bud. <laughs> He's taking his family to a place where he can really live the, the life. And we mates, and he, and he sends me another message a couple minutes later. He says to me, and I'm not making this up, it's on my phone. He says, I'm learning a valuable lesson. Money doesn't guarantee any joy. So he's there. He's in that environment. He's living the life. But an hour later, lying there, sitting there, watching the sea, he sends me this message. He says, I'm learning a valuable lesson. Money doesn't guarantee a quality of life. In other words, money doesn't guarantee Zoe. Money doesn't guarantee a quality of life. Money may give a certain amount of happiness, yes, but it doesn't guarantee life. Here's another false Zoe. Quick one. I'll finish with this one. People pleasers. Who here sitting in this hall is a people pleaser? <laughs> you put your hand up, but very softly. Eh? Some of you are people pleasers. You don't even want to put your hand up because you don't want people to even know that you're a people pleaser. Yeah? I'm putting my hand up and I'm on tippy toes because I'm a people pleaser. Oh, Daryl, great message, eh? Oh, Daryl, yes, sir. Your message is not that great today. And when, so when, when people are pleased with you, everything's going well. Quality of life, proper. When people are not pleased with you, things aren't going well. Again, I'm preaching to myself here. Yeah. People pleasers find their zoe. Daryl sometimes finds his Zoe in what people think and what people say about me. Freedom Church, wherever you're trying to find your Zoe, whatever you are trying to find your quality of life in, that's going to determine the route, the direction of your life. I'll ask you today, where are you finding your Zoe. Where are we finding our quality of life? What is it that we are finding our quality of life in? And be honest, is that thing really giving you quality of life? Because all these things that I try and feed my soul with, all these things that I try and look for a quality of life with, Jesus says, is just food that's going to spoil Bread that is going to become stale and it's going to get moldy and it's going to go off. Jesus says, feed yourself, Freedom Church, with the true bread. Feed your soul with the bread of life so that you can live a life of Zoe. Perfect? No. But a quality life. It's a meaningful life. And ultimately, eternal life, not existence. I end with a story from my week. 
My brother and I and my mom said goodbye to our aunt and to my mom's sister this week. She's 74 years old, lived a very lonely life, didn't have many friends. And, and so this week we went and we, we cleaned up her flat and we, we got in and we were able to just start sorting some things out. And as we walked through the back door into the kitchen, open plan, straight away, my left eye here, something caught my attention. It was a loaf, a half loaf of bread that was lying there. I'll show you. But it was brown. It wasn't white. It was a half a loaf of brown bread that was lying there. And we went through the flat and we started cleaning up and, and started just seeing, can we find the will and what's happening? And I thought, you know what, friends? My Auntie Carol, she'd eaten half the loaf of bread for physical energy. But it wasn't able to sustain her, and, and she passed on. And, and half the loaf was, was still left there, and it was becoming spoiled, it was becoming stale. Th that bread couldn't keep her alive. But my Auntie Carol, she knew the true bread of life. We were going through some of her journals and pieces of paper, her times praying and, and writing things from the Bible. All alone in her flat. Oh, was she all alone? No. She was with Jesus, the true bread of life. Jesus, the one who says, Auntie Carol, I am the bread of life. And because she had filled her soul with the true bread, her soul is alive and she's experiencing eternal life with Jesus right now. I ask us today, Notice, I didn't say I ask you. I come down here and I say, I ask us today to feed ourselves well. To feed ourselves well, Freedom Church. Yes, we can have great experiences and memories looking at stars at two in the morning. And you can't, you can, so you can go and ride that fast car tomorrow around Kalama. You can. Enjoy those, but I ask ourselves to feed ourselves well on the true bread. The quality, Zoe quality of life that only Jesus can give you. So that one day, and I don't know when that will be, for my Auntie Carol it was this week, one day when you take your last breath, you can hear those words from Jesus, the true bread saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. You have fed yourself well. In Jesus' name, amen.